we spoke to him earlier. I want to play this to you because I asked him about his petition, how it's going and what are the numbers like. Very good. So I started the largest campaign for nuclear power in Australia called Nuclear for Australia. Uh, and it's going incredibly well. And I think it's that the reason for that is because so many Australians support nuclear power and so many Australians believe that we should be able to have all options on the table as we try to deal with the energy and climate crisis and that we need to consider nuclear power as an option. So we've got over 20,000 people who've now signed our petition at nuclearforaustralia.com slash petition uh, for the government to lift the bans on nuclear power. So it's massive level of grassroots support and I've just been really uh, blown away by the support we've been able to receive from it. Yeah, I think it's impressive for anyone to pull this off, uh, more so for you, and we'll talk a bit about you shortly, but uh, mm. the issue, the issue, I get the feeling that it might not even necessarily be that people support nuclear, it's just they don't understand why we have an absolute cold, hard no to it. Yeah, I, I think it, it goes in the face of the democracy that we're in in Australia, where Australians were never actually asked in the late 19, 1990s uh, if they wanted nuclear power to be banned and if they wanted our nation to, you know, basically adopt one of the most hostile positions towards nuclear power of any country around the world. Australia is the only member of the G20 with a ban on nuclear power. And these prohibitions were rushed through in the late 1990s Actually, under the Howard government, they were a trade-off uh, to get funding for the Lucas Heights reactor 30 kilometres away from Sydney. So it wasn't even a good decision that was being made. It's not like there was a vote uh, done by the people. It's not like there was a committee process or anything like that. But it's been just hugely, con hugely consequential decision because you think it, if Australia didn't have those legal prohibitions and we had the option for nuclear power, the position we would be in, Today, and I think we wouldn't have to be dealing with the same issues in terms of the energy and climate crisis. But yeah. I think it absolutely just makes no sense uh, that when we're experiencing all these issues, that we would have the hubris here in Australia to think that we can just limit ourselves and have a tunnel vision approach to this energy transition where we're going to just completely ignore one of the cleanest and most reliable sources of power, which has been used by some of our leading partners around the world as a proven our technology to decarbonise. You look back to Australia, we've got some of the highest power prices, we've got some of the lowest reliability of power, and we've got some of the highest emissions. So yeah. I do not think we're in a position to rule out a technology like nuclear. <laughs> but we do. You know, it's interesting. You talk about back when the Howard government made the decision to ban, in inverted commas, which actually not mm. inverted commas, it's true, they banned it, banned nuclear power, a nuclear reactor other than the one for Lucas Heights, the price of power, and you probably weren't even born then, the price no. of power was a fraction. I mean, we're talking like about 15% of what it is today. So back then we could do things like mm. that because it didn't matter back then, but it sure as hell matters now. I think it definitely does. And I think it's really concerning that politicians are not waking up to the fact that you know, some of the current choices that they are making do have an effect on power prices in Australia. I don't think it's a coincidence that oh, yeah. when you look no. around the world, the countries that do have nuclear power have some of the lowest power bills. Yet in Australia, our politicians tell us that nuclear power is the most expensive form of power. I just don't think that really makes sense. And I think you can see the consequences of, it, you know, excluding nuclear power from our mix here today where we've got such high energy bills, which soon I'll have to pay. And I don't want to really think about that at the moment, to be honest with you, knowing how high they I are. I know, mate. What you've got and to start doing is saving. You've got to start good. saving for your first power bill. I will bill. have to, yeah. <laughs> hey, um, <laughs> yeah. have you ever sat down and, and looked on a map and put X's where you think they could be or should be, the plants? Uh, no, and I don't think that's my position as a 17-year-old to yes. inform that. I was yeah. working alongside some experts who we've brought on book uh, we've brought into our organisation Nuclear for Australia. We've just set up an expert working group. That's got some of the nation's leading experts, such as um, Tony Irwin, who commissioned nine or eight nuclear reactors in the UK, A.D. Patterson, former CEO of ANSTO, even Jasmine Diab as well. So I, I'd, I'd much rather leave it to those experts to work out. But I think the important thing is when you're thinking of the NIMBYism sort of debate, uh, and people being concerned about having nuclear power plant in their backyard. 
first of all, that it is safe uh, if that did happen for someone to have a nuclear power plant in their backyard, because nuclear power is the second safest form of energy, actually produces less radiation uh, than get this uh, Parliament House because of the amount of rock in, which is forms uh, which is needed in the structure of Parliament House, which people would probably be a bit surprised from. But in addition to that, nuclear is just such an energy dense energy source, which means that one nuclear reactor produces as much power as around 3 million solar panels or around uh, 300 wind turbines. So the benefit is that you don't need as many sites uh, for these nuclear reactors. So it's very, very unlikely that you would ever have to have a nuclear reactor in your backyard. Well, yeah. I mean, that's just not how we are. Uh, we, and we have plenty of sites where we could put things we just choose not to, and we've 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 chosen to for an ideological reason, and that's stupid. When ideology is the guide, that just is stupid. Tell me, um, just a little about you. I, I've heard you speak a few times, and I've seen you on television. And what straight away strikes is when when no one knows your age until you tell them, or until they see you. What? Why are you doing this? Well, look, I think that. Obviously, I think it's been really disheartening for me as a young person when I look at the issues Australia is currently experiencing. And I only, you know, I think the first thing is to basically say that we're not really taught, taught about nuclear power in school, and that's because it's banned. So the nuclear literacy in this country is just so low, and it actually had to take me stumbling across nuclear power in a school assignment and to in year 10 realise that nuclear power was banned to actually get really curious about why Australia wouldn't be considering it. And I think. As I, as I did more research and as I started reaching out to experts, it just really, really baffled me why we, wouldn't, we did rule out a technology like nuclear, which provides low carbon, low cost and really reliable power. Um, and I think as part of that, I was really concerned seeing that how so many experts in Australia were you know, privately saying and communicating to me that they thought that we needed nuclear power, um, but they had been just consistently ignored by politicians on all sides of politics. And that really compelled me to act. So I yeah. started sharing information on social media. I think then, you know, given I was a 16 year old at the time, uh, it was easy for me to get a bit of attention for what I was doing. Um, and I made sure to capitalize on that to try and push the debate forward. It's, it's interesting because people who used to be for nuclear power, and I did it for many years on, mm -hmm. on radio, and you get put into a into the whack job uh, kind of mm. pa paddock, and people go, he's a whack job, you know. And, and But yeah. it, funnily enough, you've not, that's not happened to you. And the weird thing about this is, oh. well, no, I don't think it has to the same degree. I mean, there, there's some nasty bastards that say horrible things about you, but that's life, yeah. you know, unfortunately <laughs> that's life. What, what sort of happened, weirdly, is... You know, you listed a few big names that are in, in nuclear power that have come to you. <laughs> They've come. I heard the other day Dick Smith has come to you. So yeah. this this is not how it works, is it? But it is how it's working. It, it is it is kind of strange, and I've been really really grateful to Dick Smith uh, for his support. He helped me get to the climate conference COP twenty eight last year. Um, but in addition to that, there are just so many people who you wouldn't think support nuclear power who do. Even last night, Peter Malinowskis told Chris Kenny on Sky News that uh, th he said, quote, the simple fact is we need nuclear power globally to decarbonise the energy sector. So that's a, an Australian Labor Premier yeah. who's voicing his support for nuclear power. So it's not just a, I think what really concerns me is when people try to, you know, pigeonhole people who support nuclear power and they say things like, oh, you must be conservative, oh, you must hate renewables, all those sort of things. Mm. Because when you look not only to Australia, but around the world, nuclear power is a uniting cause. You look to the US where despite, you know, we all know how partisan politics is in the US and how many things the, the Republicans and Democrats disagree on. But one of the things they're united by is their support for nuclear power. Both the Democrats, Joe Biden, He's investing billions of dollars through their Inflation Reduction Act into boosting nuclear power there in the US, where they recently also signed a pledge to triple nuclear capacity by 2050 there. So, and even to the UK, where both the UK Labor leader uh, and the Conservatives there support it, even the Finnish Greens in Finland um, 
So it, it should be a uniting cause. Yeah. You look at the credentials. You're in some very nuclear, interesting company, it, aren't it, it you? Really? Yeah. Oh, yeah. It's amazing. And, you know, I uh, always you get people come back and, and, and I can hear right now there'll be people dying to ring through and say, but what if it, what if it all goes wrong, mm. you know, and, and, and people lose their lives? And, and I, I always say sort of back at them, well, there are a lot of things going wrong right now because people can't afford to have power. And there are a hell of a lot of lives being affected by the enormous costs that are being uh, injected into our lives because of the incredible price of energy. So, you know, it, it, it depends what you want to eliminate in your argument. Look, really fascinating to talk mm. to you. And and um, and I'm sorry to bring up age, but I, I think that's what makes this impressive is that a young guy is pushing it and making a difference. And at the same time, that, that same issue is what allows some people to sort of try to trivialize it. But I just think it is brilliant that you're doing this and – I admire your courage, but I also admire your intellect. It's great talking to you, Will. Thank you so much. I really appreciate that. All the best, mate.